Our final chapter together this semester is about reproductive physiology. Reproductive physiology is a topic that is very complex. The reason that this one is saved for the end of the semester is because it's complex and it depends on a lot of things, mechanisms that are going on in other systems that we've already talked about. So it's a little bit ironic to be giving you such an abridged version of this chapter. This is an incredibly complex topic. Uh, I've got it pared down to 10 slides. We're going to go through this in 10 slides. And again, we're, we're just going to be covering some of the main, the main ideas. We're certainly not going over all of the important uh, topics. But this is the best we can do with the time that we have. So let's take a look. The human life cycle. If we just take a look at this layout here, um, adult humans have reproductive organs, which are called gonads. In males, the gonads are the testes. In females, the gonads would be the ovaries. And those specialized organs are the sites where reproductive cells can be produced by meiosis. We talked about meiosis way earlier on in the semester, back when we were going through cell division. Meiosis is a special type of cell division where the chromosome number is halved when it, when it happens, when this type of cell division takes place. So we start off with uh, with a cell that has 46 chromosomes, 23 unique chromosomes, but we have a copy from mom and copy from dad. So start with one of those cells and then take it through meiosis and what you end up with is a cell that has half the number of chromosomes. So sperm or eggs, um, they're going to have a total of 23 chromosomes and just one copy of each of those. So meiosis is what produces the sperm and the egg um, on this slide, instead of calling it an egg, it's labeled an ovum. That's the same thing. It's just an egg cell. And these are produced in the gonads. So after they are produced, fertilization, the joining of the two nuclei together, would produce a diploid zygote. A zygote is back to having two copies of each of its chromosomes. It gets one copy from dad and one copy from mom. The zygote that's produced can be either male or female, depending on which type of sperm was donated. Does the sperm have an X chromosome or does it have a Y chromosome? And that gets us into a reminder about different types of chromosomes. So the 23 chromosomes that are present in these, um, in, the, in the gametes, those 23 chromosomes, mostly they are just autosomal. They're encoding information for production of body cells. Those are called autosomal chromosomes, but there's one pair that is not autosomal, and those are the sex chromosomes. So for females, females have a total of two X chromosomes. Males have a total of one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. So this should hopefully be some review. Something you may or may not know already at this point is that in females, in all of the cells of a female, one of the X chromosomes gets inactivated, the chromatin gets modified, and so those genes are suppressed. Um, so that means in each cell, either the genes from mom are being expressed or the genes from dad are being expressed with regards to the X chromosome. Um, however, this, this is something that, um, so if you're talking about one individual person, it's not like all of that person's cells are gonna be either expressing genes from mom or dad. It can be a combination. So some of the cells will express the genes from the mom's X chromosome, and others will express the genes from the dad's X chromosome. Uh, it can be some variation there. The inactivated X chromosome is called a bar body. Bar body right there. The X and Y chromosomes, the sex chromosomes, they look very different. The X chromosome is much larger than the Y, and that goes right along with the fact that it has a lot more genes. The X chromosome has over a thousand genes, whereas the Y chromosome only has about 80. A lot of the genes that are on the Y chromosome are specific for guiding the development of testes. And let's jump over to this schematic here. So interestingly, after fertilization takes place, when a new zygote has formed um, and it's undergoing the early stages of development, um, males and females actually seem pretty, pretty similar initially. They sort of start with the same basic body template. And then what happens is if there is a Y chromosome present, 
then one of the genes on that Y chromosome, it's called the SRY gene, if that one is present and if it's being expressed, that will lead to some changes in the body plan. Some things will be inhibited, other things will be promoted to develop. And so that leads to the male development. Males end up developing differently from sort of the default female development that, that was in place. In the end, um, the testes are what are produced as a result of the expression of this gene. And then testes produce a couple of things that help to guide development. Testosterone is one of the hormones that the testes produce. And then there's another, another one, uh, the malarian inhibiting factor, MIF. This is something that inhibits development of fallopian tubes and a uterus. So without this, um, again, it's kind of like the default is, is the female body plan. Without MIF, um, what would happen is a uterus would develop and fallopian tubes would develop. So that's following more the, the female body plan. So the presence of these two substances, testosterone and MIF, this ultimately ends up leading to masculinization in the male body. The masculinization that takes place, of course, ends up influencing many different things, many of the different organ systems that we've gone through. Um, it even influences how the brain develops. And all of this that we're talking about so far, this is very early on in development. This is before a baby is born, uh, very on, early on in development, testosterone is having these, these effects. Um, testosterone production tends to stop by sometime in the third trimester, and then it picks up again once, once a person is going through puberty. So there's kind of like a, a break um, in testosterone production, and then it comes back into play in puberty. If testosterone or MIF are not produced in sufficient amounts, or if, um, if there are insufficient receptors for those substances, that can lead to problems with sexual development. Sexual development can, can be abnormal, not follow the typical male or female body plan. Um, this is called hermaphroditism. This is where there are, there's kind of a combination, some female characteristics and some male characteristics. That is something that can happen. Um, this can be due to a couple of different reasons. It could be mistakes during cell division early on in um, fetal development. So if, for example, if some of the cells receive a complete Y chromosome, but others do not receive a complete Y chromosome, then it's kind of like there's going to be mixed development going on in different locations throughout the body. That can lead to hermaphroditism. Another type of um, disorder that, that can come up is just due to abnormal amounts of hormones, hormones being produced. So for example, in a, in a female body, if there's an overproduction of androgens from the adrenal glands, this can lead to development of certain male characteristics. Um, so there could even end up being a mismatch between what type of gonads a person has and perhaps what other accessory structures they have. Like maybe there are ovaries inside, um, but male, male anatomy on the outside. So kind of unusual combinations can, can result depending on what's going on with, um, with the genes and expression in early development. When a person reaches puberty, uh, there are two key hormones that come into play. And this is where we're starting to sort of gloss over a lot of the details. This, this is very complex, how these hormones work. The two key hormones that I'd like you to be aware of are uh, uh, right here on the slide, FSH and LH. These are present in both males and females. Um, in both, both they have a key role in facilitating um, production and maintenance of, of gonad structures and of other characteristics throughout the body. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are hormones that we have seen before way back when we were in, I think it was chapter 8, when we were talking about the endocrine system and what the anterior pituitary gland does. Remember this one? This was a gland that uh, produces many different substances. It's in the brain. And one of the things that it does is it regulates the amount of gonadotropin hormones that are in circulation throughout the body. Ultimately, we said the anterior pituitary is stimulated by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus produces um, gonadotropin releasing hormone. So if this is present, it causes the anterior pituitary to re release FSH and LH. And then those go into circulation and they influence what the gonads are doing, what hormones the gonads are producing in either males or females. Either way, it's these same hormones at work. 
Ultimately, all of this is controlled by a negative feedback loop. So this slide in large part, this is meant to just tie back in with things we've seen earlier in the semester. Um, should be giving you some, some flashbacks to when we talked about hormones, but negative feedback loops help to control how much gonadotropin releasing hormone the hypothalamus is producing and also um, how many gonadotropins the anterior pituitary is, is even releasing into the bloodstream. What these two hormones do, the gonadotropins, FSH and LH, um, they help to, to regulate a few key things with regards to reproduction. They help to stimulate uh, production of sperm and eggs, so that's number one. They also help to um, stimulate how many sex hormones are being produced by the gonads, and that includes things like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, um, and then they also help to just maintain the structures, physical structures throughout the body that are relevant in reproduction.